Hey, what's up, everybody? My name is Dr. Mark Gomez, but you can call me Dr. G, and welcome to Health360 with Dr. G. Today's topic, no more leaks, building strong pelvic floor health. Both women and men have a pelvic floor. You might ask, what's a pelvic floor? Simply stated, the pelvic floor consists of the muscles, ligaments, connective tissues, and nerves that support our pelvic organs. For many people, particularly women, the pelvic floor does not work as well as it should. According to the National Institutes of Health, almost 25% of women have pelvic floor disorders. For men, although the prevalence is lower, they too can suffer from pelvic health issues. Today on Health360 with Dr. G, we are going to cover the most common pelvic floor disorders and discuss how to prevent or treat them. Again, my name is Dr. Mark Gomez, Dr. G, board certified internal medicine physician practicing out of Edward Hospital in Naperville, Illinois. I'm also a member of the American College of Lifestyle Medicine. You can follow me across all the socials at health360w.g and check me out on my website at health360podcast.com. We have a great show for you. And before you meet my guests, let me hit you with a quick disclaimer. The content of Health360 with Dr. G, a healthy driven podcast is for your information and entertainment purposes only. The content is not intended to be a substitute for professional medical advice, diagnosis, or treatment. So let's get it for y'all. I want to introduce you to my first guest today. She's a repeat guest here on Health360 with Dr. G, longtime friend, colleague. She's taking care of so many of my patients, and I really appreciate her professionalism and what she does, and also her education, because every time uh, we talk, I always learn something, which is great. And so I just want to welcome her back to the show. I want to introduce Dr. Kelly Gershley. Let me read you her credentials, because her credentials run deep. Dr. Kelly Gershley is a board-certified urogynecologist with Illinois Urogynecology LTD. She's also the medical director, Women's Center for Pelvic Medicine at Edward Hospital. Doc, welcome to the show. Thank you. Happy welcome to be back, here. as we should say. Let's say it right. There you go. It's good to see you again. Yeah. You know, uh, Dr. Gershley, every comic book hero has their origin story. Tell us about medical school, where you went, residency, and why this topic is so important for you today. So I think it all starts, I was born in Minnesota, and I have three sisters. And so my interest in women's health started young. I did medical school at Midwestern University here in Downers Grove, and then OBGYN residency at St. Joseph Hospital in Chicago, followed by fellowship at University of Chicago, North Shore University Health System in female pelvic medicine and reconstructive surgery. And I've been now in practice with Illinois Urogynecology out of Edward Elmhurst since 2014. And tell me, Dr. George Lee, how, how, how did you end up in this, in this field? How did, they, how, does, you know, how did this passion just come to you? You know, when I think about, you know, we, we do things in life and they just they fall in our laps and you just, just lean into it. How did you lean into this field? I've always been interested in women's health. And it was specifically this quality of life issue that I saw impacting a lot of women and interfering with their ability to do what they wanted to do every day. So it was in that interest that got me centered in pelvic health. I love it. Well, thank you. It's great having you back on the show, Doc. So my next guest, she and I have known each other for a long time as well, too. She's helped out with so many of my patients, just longtime friend, colleague. I, I appreciate her professionalism, her care, uh, and making the care very personal. So I want to welcome to the show, Natalie Florio. Natalie Florio, let me read your credentials because they run deep. Natalie Florio is an amazing physical therapist, Edward Elmer's Health. Natalie, welcome to the show. Oh, thank you. Well, I've been with Edward since 2006. Um, I did my undergrad studies in uh, at Benedictine University and then graduate school at um, Northern. And up until about 2010, I did only orthopedics. Um, I started getting more into wanting to train for the women's health when I'd ask the ortho patient coming in with back pain to have any bowel or bladder issues. And they'd say, well, no, not because of this, but because of that. And I was, that was it. I wasn't doing anything for that patient. So it wasn't until after my child, my second one that I started having some issues as well and decided, okay, I need to do something. So I started doing some um, studies through the APTA and have gone on with Herman and Wallace and did my training through mostly Herman and Wallace, but, um, and now I'm able to incorporate the orthopedic group and the women's health, as we'll see today, how closely they're so related, um, but it's really helped me to continue practicing. And I've been, um, yeah, practicing for 17 years now. So 
Wonderful. Well, it's great having you. And it's so yeah. great when you, when you, when the, when the story of your journey is so personal mm -hmm. and you can share that personal uh, story with others and we show empathy and, and that certainly tells us, Hey, I got you on this one. I got your back on this one. And it really empowers people to take control of their health and knowing that there's a community support and really around this topic of pelvic floor disorder disorders, we do have to continue to tell people that there's hope out there. There are people out there pulling for you each and every day. So it's great having you on, Natalie. Thank so there you, you go, everybody. You met my amazing guest, the panel's hashtag fear. So here's how the show works. I ask the questions. My amazing panelists give me awesome answers. Write something down. You know, I like to tell people, grab your favorite pen and pencil. Write it down. I like this pen right here, health360podcast.com. Something about that neuromuscular connection. You know, write it down. You know, you get it in your mind and it empowers you to make these awesome decisions. Again, you are your best advocate out there. My healthcare team of experts are here to help you along the way. So we'll do the chief complaint. We'll get into some myths versus facts, of course, at the end. Of course, I got a section that we do on each episode uh, of frequently asked questions. And I have a surprise for both Dr. George Lee and Natalie Florio today on a nice little surprise. That's all I'll say right now. I'm not going to leak too much about it, but we'll talk about it. It'll be great. I can't wait. So uh, let's get right after it, y'all. This is great. So when people come to our office, we call it the chief complaint. So the chief complaint, aka the question of the hour is this. I love it. Here's the question. What are the most common pelvic floor disorders and how do we prevent or treat them? So Dr. Jersley, let me start with you. I kind of gave a little bit of a, just a simple 30,000 foot view of the pelvic floor in my opening remarks, but in your terms, you know, what should people know about the pelvic floor? What is it and why is it so important? So I explain the pelvic floor to patients as the foundation of your core, something that supports everything that you do from getting out of bed to driving your car to making dinner. And it is one of those things that we don't pay any attention to generally until it starts to dysfunction. And pelvic floor dysfunction can present itself in a number of ways. And the ways I see it traditionally present in my practice are urinary incontinence, so involuntary loss of urine, either preceded by urgency or with coughing, straining, other activities, increase in abdominal pressure. Pelvic floor disorders can present as prolapse, which is weakness in the anatomic supports vaginally, which traditionally causes pressure, heaviness, and fullness vaginally. And uh, additionally, you can have fecal incontinence, which is involuntary loss of gas or stool. Excellent. You know, and I think that's why, you know, when you hit, hit the head on now, it's like, why is it important? Because people don't want to have these symptoms and the way you describe it, you know, sometimes you got to get really personal. And we know sometimes people may, may not want to come forthright with personal information. Mm -hmm. And so, um, and so it's, it's, it's important that we have open discussion and, and, and have the discussion in a very non-judgmental way, correct? Oh, absolutely. And my office, we talk about everything. I, I spend more time talking about bowel movements than I ever thought I would. And I think it's important that we talk about how those things impact what we're doing every day and get comfortable discussing what works and what doesn't work. I think life is short. Yeah, I think as healthcare uh, practitioners, you know, we want to tell our patients, we want to empower them and say, hey, nothing is off the tables, you know, right. if I can't help if I don't know what's going on, but just creating that environment. So I'm glad you're able to tell that. I remember you telling me that before, by the way, that you said you never thought that you'd be spending so much time talking about bowels in your career and never. you have. Mm -hmm. <laughs> but it's really important and yeah. it dramatically, I mean, getting your bowels on track can significantly improve urinary symptoms and pressure and heaviness. So it, it makes sense, but yeah, I appreciate you. You know, Natalie, uh, can you give us a, a, a some kind of the scenario? So people come into your office, uh, you know, as a role as a, as a physical therapist, you know, you get you get the patients from Dr. Gershley or from me, for example, or other of our colleagues. But 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 what can people expect when they come in and see you for pelvic floor? So um, definitely, the, the the most important part to me is just sitting down and just starting to talk with the patient because you get. A lot of information that way trying to you, you do have to break down a little wall sometimes to get them to talk about some of these really intimate things but it does tell you a full story um i always start all of the therapists i work with in the women's health crew uh start with the orthopedic assessment um because sometimes they'll even just present with low back pain or other um symptoms before we even if they didn't come from you know you guys so it's good just to uh, always incorporate it in but do the ortho assessment um talk about bowel, uh, bowel and bladder issues, um, 
discomfort, pain, because that can be a whole nother issue as well going on with the pelvic floor. Uh, and then as therapists, we also do do an internal exam. So to check for uh, pelvic floor, it might be too tight due to what they're you know, reporting um, to test strength for if they're having some incontinence, get some better numbers objectively. Um, and then we do have biofeedback in the office. So we um, are able to use a little probe in the vagina. The patient can actually see or rectum can see um, the muscle contraction and we get into all of that. Um, and then if cat, of course we bring it back fully back to the body. So core, hips, glutes, strengthening, um, it's a full body type of strengthening or uh, decreasing tone. So then decreasing hip tightness, uh, wh whatever, whichever direction we're going. So it's a, it's a, an hour and a half evaluation for a reason. It's, it's pretty extensive. Well, I, th I think to get to, to, to granular and, and I guess, you know, no two patients are alike. I know there's no. some commonalities, of course, when you think about the broader diagnoses, but but you're making it personal and you have to make yeah. it personal um, to know that, again, I'm with you on this on this concern and we're going to do our darnness to help you out. But it always comes back to education. I think that's the thing with us as clinicians. We want to educate our patients mm -hmm. and empower them with education and action. Mm -hmm. Let me come back at you, Natalie, on this question. You mentioned the words like a tight, you know, tightness. Uh, um, so well, people may read like magazines or blogs. They might say, that, referring to the pelvic floor, they might say, oh, I have a tight pelvic floor or maybe the weak pelvic floor. You know, what's the difference between like this hypertonic mm -hmm. tight and maybe a hypotonic weak? Sure. So um, some patients will come in and they've maybe gone to the gynecologist or gone to the urogynecologist and they've noticed um, they have painful intercourse or they have pain with tampon use or just tightness in the, just the pelvic region. So these patients tend to have um, just increased cramping muscle tone uh, in those areas that cause the pain. It can cause constipation issues. It can cause voiding issues, um, but then it goes on to cause hip and low back issues. Uh, the opposite would be that uh, hyper, like the very weak low tone where we possibly have more prolapsing going on, um, more incontinence going on. And that can be wrecked, uh, you know, like a loss of urine or feces, um, muscles, all the same, it's all attached there. So, um, there's just different treatments for each, um, diagnosis and you can have a little of both. So mm -hmm. I've had patients that are present tight but they're weak. And the only reason why you don't know they're weak yet is because when they're contracting, they don't know how to relax. Mm -hmm. So it looks like, oh, you're strong. You know, you, once you get that tone relaxed, you realize they can't even do a contraction now. So you mm -hmm. can have a combination and just have to know which avenue to start with um, to not over rev up that already too tight muscle by doing Kegels. It may not be appropriate. So you have to know what's going on um, mm -hmm. in which direction to treat it. So those so are the differences between the two. Thank you. So, so Dr. Dursley's, you know, when you're working with your, your team and you're working with, our, with, with, with patients and you send them out to pelvic floor therapy or, or just how does that influence, and maybe, and maybe it depends on the diagnosis that you're specifically dealing with, but, but how does the, the therapist role uh, kind, of, kind of help your overall management plan as well too? I think physical therapy is fantastic because it, it offers to patients an individualized approach. And that's how I describe it because like Natalie says, no two patients are the same. You have to do an assessment of every patient. And I explain because everyone looks at me sideways when I recommend pelvic floor therapy for these sorts of issues that you like want me what? to do what? what? Right. <laughs> and everyone assumes you're going to be right next to the guy rehabbing his shoulder mm -hmm. and nobody wants to do it. And so I explain it's an individualized evaluation where they do, they look at posture, core, pelvic muscle strength and coordination. And then the other important thing, the therapists do a fantastic job of talking to them about priorities. So it is very common for patients to have a, several different complaints and it doesn't do us any good to focus on a bulge complaint, let's say if their primary bother is a urinary complaint. And so the evaluation lays out priorities and then allows the therapist to, through the evaluation and identification of the pathology there to evolve through the therapy to address their priorities. So it's really individualized. It's also a modality that has the opportunity to address all of the pelvic floor issues from the tension and weakness, leakage, bulge, pressure, heaviness, fullness. And, and it really gives the patients a better understanding of exactly 
what's happening. And, you know, I see patients all the time say, I never knew how to do a Kegel or I'll ask a patient, do a Kegel and, and they push instead of pull a, a lot of the time. And so it's, it's backward. And so we, we just need to educate patients. Like your bowels should move every day. A Kegel shouldn't be a push. You shouldn't ever strain to void. You just have to, we have to educate them. And then physical therapy takes it one step further and just shows them, okay, this is what you should be working on, which is really helpful. Mm-hmm. Dr. Dershley is so they nice to ahead, work Natalie. with because there's been many a times, and you know this, where you've sent a patient over and I do the assessment. We're blessed to have the 90 minutes and I send her a message. I'm going to send you this evaluation. Can you sign off? Cause I'm adding this and this, and this is yeah. diagnosis mm-hmm. <laughs> on top of what they came for, because you got to treat the person as a whole. I mean, I've even thrown balance on there a few times just because that's even mm-hmm. off for the whole body. So, um, she's wonderful to work um, with, I, was, so. I was probably going to say, Natalie, as 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 us as, as docs and so Dr. Jersley, you know, if, you know, just because you know we trust you so much and what and what you and your team do, that mm-hmm. we're just going to be like, go, yes, right, all of it, <laughs> all it, <Yes>. yes. <laughs> <They're> like, <laughs> yeah, stay okay. up, so I love it. But it's also about it is a team effort. There's no mm-hmm. doubt about it, and, and 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 it's like having the dream team of people to help you out. It's like no single person can do it at, uh, at, on their own. And just like when I think about my patient of diabetes or heart disease, see where we're getting mul- a multidisciplinary approach mm-hmm. involved. So here's the question, Cal- Dr. Jersey, I got this for you. So when it comes to treating the pelvic floor, mm-hmm. who, who's, who's on the team? Like, like how many doctors, how many different specialties are involved in pelvic floor medicine, in your opinion? Well, <laughs> a lot. So it's absolutely... Um, it can involve gastroenterology, mm-hmm. the, I mean, primary care, if they mm-hmm. have underlying thyroid disease, which impacts their bowel function, yep. certainly gynecology, it can also involve orthopedics. If they have underlying, um, joint issues that are contributing, it's, um, I mean, it, it, it can be everybody cause they all influence it. You know, little things like are, are really terrible diabetic who has poor sugar control will have much, tends to have much worse incontinence symptoms can have infections, which impact symptoms. And so it's, it's, it's everybody. And, and the great thing is we, with everybody having their little um, piece of the puzzle, we can put it all together, you know? And so it it works really well in a multidisciplinary approach because we have the opportunity to attack it at so many different angles, if you will, and involve everybody. And I think what helps the most, especially when working with the physical therapist and and, and what we do is uh, echoing themes, right? Patients will always, they love it when we all say the same thing. And I don't know why, you know, they don't, um, you know, when I sort of give my my bowel instructions. And then Natalie gives her same instructions. And like, you guys say the same thing. It's like, well, of course we do. Like, <laughs> you know, it makes sense, but it's it's nice to hear that echo because then patients- they like of, they have that carryover. They do, they yeah. tend to like that. Yeah, that's true. Yeah. Well, let me ask you this question, Natalie. You know, when people come in, and then we're going to get into a, a few um, before for a few sections before I get into some FAQs. But but people come in. You know, how do you do expectations? You know, we live in a society of instant gratifications. Let's just be honest. Uh, we want to rehab something, you know, from zero to one hundred mile, miles mm-hmm. an hour and get the get the, get the solution now because I'm working. I only have you know this amount of free time. But what are the expectations? How do you kind of just keep it real with the people that come through your office? Yeah, this has been probably being an orthopedic therapist. Um, you know, when you have a rotator cuff repair, they see the change. They see it. You know, they physically see it. Um, this is where you have to really be a good cheerleader for these patients coming in because it's so easy for them just to say, oh, I'm not seeing it. I'm still leaking. So educating how long it takes for muscles to get stronger um, is probably my number one, you know, pep talk when we first meet that you're going to see, you know, it's going to take some time before you see changes. And then every visit or every couple of visits, it's the little things that keep them motivated. Um, honestly, probably my biggest Um, thing that keeps people on is they're sharing very intimate things with me. So I always let them know when I first meet them that I have a prolapse and I've done the therapy and I have to continue with my exercises or symptoms can reoccur. Um, And I'm very honest to each patient that comes in as we talk about it. I, I do the same thing with orthopedics. If I had something going on or a past injury, I would tell them, you know, I, 
I understand and just keep them going. But I'm very honest with these women's health patients. And I feel like if I can let them know, and I exercise and I do everything and, and I kept myself in a good place, it kind of does motivate them to, to stay focused. Cause it is, they can't see it. You know, it's not until they have um, no pain with intercourse or they're not leaking on the way to the bathroom. Those are their wins, but that's going to take some time to get to that point. So it's oh usually gosh. just, uh, just, just talking to them and keeping them positive and keeping them focused. So Dr. Churchley, what are the, what are, you know, what are the, some of the just broad view, but what are the top causes? You know, people may ask, why does this happen to me? Why me? Right. So when you see people in your practice, what do you kind of tell them is about, you know, what are the causes of the pelvic floor? So the first thing I tell them, and I think what, what Natalie was getting at is I, we t- I talk about how prevalent it is. We don't, one in three women has a pelvic floor disorder, one in three. And we don't talk about it enough for patients to feel like they're not the only one. So the, initially you have to hear the patient and express to them that they're, they're not alone. There are lots of other women have these issues. We don't talk about it a lot, but, and there are lots of ways to address it. And then, um, and then I also explain um, it's multifactorial pregnancy, delivery, lifestyle, recreational activities, weight, hormones, ultimately what connective tissue makes you, you, that's what I say. So it comes down to all those things. And then the, the benefit in that discussion is that you can't just blame one thing because so many people want to blame, oh, it was my, um, you know, my, my forcep delivery or my 10 pound baby and all of those things contribute, but they're not enough to blame specifically. So it's multifactorial. And I just go through all of those things. And yes. then in, in the discussion of treatments, talk about all the things you should do to optimize those symptoms, right? The, the first is achieve and maintain a healthy body weight. So it's having those discussions like, okay, you, you can have your hopes for treatment, but we also need to set some expectations for how we need to sustain and bowels. Yeah. yeah well, that goal. It is. And so, you know, it's, it's so, it's so interesting because as I see patients and they, they tell me stuff and then I, you know, give a little bit of an overview, but then move them towards your, both of your directions. You know, I think it's really this continuum that we have to continue to talk about. Uh, we want our patients to get better and we want them to continue to uh, feel comfortable with who they're going to see and someone that's going to really help them out along the way. You know, speaking along the way, and I think about common things being common, as you mentioned, the commonality of this, Dr. George Lee, one in three women with pelvic floor disorders, which is just so darn common. You know, some of the top things that you mentioned earlier, um, urinary incontinence, fecal incontinence, pelvic organ prolapse, you know, when do you talk, start talking about um, medication or in our surgical approaches, when you get to that point, generally speaking? So I love to talk and I have patients only for a few minutes. And so I give it all to them. I'll, I'll, the, the, I start at the beginning and say, you know, this is, these are the issues. These are the possible treatments and then work with patients to, to get a sense of what their priorities are and what the options are within those priorities. That makes sense. And then one more question related to that. So say somebody goes down a surgical route. Mm-hmm. Um, and again, you're probably saying the same things that, 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 um, that Natalie's saying when it comes to therapy, just be realistic. You mm-hmm. know, again, people want to know, is this going to be a surefire thing, doc? Mm-hmm. And, you know, how do you kind of respond to those kind of questions? So I explained that the, the multitude of reasons that contribute to pelvic floor problems make it challenging to fix definitively because everybody wants a quick fix or the I, I don't want to mess with physical therapy I want the definitive treatment and unfortunately inherent to the multiple reasons for prolapse that doesn't exist so even well done surgeries have recurrences 30 percent of patients can have bulge again after pelvic floor reconstructive surgery of those less than 10 generally less than 10 percent generally require Reoperation, but recurrence is absolutely a risk inherent to what we can accomplish surgically, just given the nature of pelvic floor problems. So I just have a really open discussion about all of the available options and then what the expectations are related to those options. And I, I love what I do. I'm comfortable and confident in what I do. I just don't have any guarantee. Mm-hmm. So they have to sort of weigh benefits and risks for themselves based on where benefits outweigh risks personally and their priorities. Wonderful. I appreciate the honesty on that one. And just, I just tell our patients, we want to empower them to make the decisions. Mm-hmm. You know, I always kind of tell my patients, I'm like, I'm like your coach. Um, mm-hmm. You know, as the saying goes, you can, 
you could uh, I'm going to butcher the sayings, by the way, of course, but it's like you could, you could, you know, show somebody the water or walk the horse to the water, but you can't make the horse drink from it. And I'm not good at those kind of phrases. So I just butchered it for everybody. But you guys know what I'm saying. But no, but it's important. It's important that we have that dialogue and then tell them how to, how to continue to approach. You know, Natalie, when you see, last question I'm going to ask you, and then we're going to get into some FAQs, but Natalie, when you see people come in post-surgically mm -hmm. as part of the continuum of care, how do you, how do you then take it from where Dr. Jersley and her colleagues may have left it off to really get that person maybe towards across that finish line with success. Yeah, I agree with um, Dr. Dershley. It's just, you know, there's no hundred percent that that surgery is going to solve it. So we're still having to strengthen what's weak, um, pelvic floor, hips, stomach, core. I mean, there's still a, a group, you know, uh, muscles that need to be strengthened. So it's not just, you know, you get the surgery and you're done. I, and I equate it to like a rotator cuff. I'll say to them, you know, patients will have a rotator cuff surgery. It doesn't mean they're done. Now we have to work on stretching it and then getting that strength back again. So it's, if I put it in those terms, it seems to be more understandable, I think, because of where the area is that we're discussing. But I tell them it's muscle, it's tendon, it's ligament. It's no different than any other area in your body. So um, you still have to rehab. You still have to do the exercises just in a different way. So that's where All we come right. back in again. There we go. Well, before we get to FAQs, frequently asked questions, I want to, I missed something at the beginning that I was going to share with Dr. Jershley and Natalie Florio about an interesting study that I had. So here's a study, and I want to get your, your both of your uh, takes on this. So this is a study. It was published in De on December 3rd, 2020. It was published in the Journal of Strength and Conditioning Research. So here's, a, here's the author, Skog et al. And the title of the study was Prevalence of Pelvic Floor Dysfunction bother and risk factors and knowledge of the pelvic floor muscles in Norwegian male and female power lifters and Olympic weightlifters. So here's a kind of background story. You know, the background story was believe that strenuous exercise can be a contributing factor to pelvic floor dysfunction. So what they did, um, power lifters and of course, Olympic weightlifters use an external loading to then engage in their activity. And then we wanted to see as they had that high external loads, can it lead towards pelvic floor dysfunction? So what they did at the study, they took athletes over the age of 18 years. So again, Nor this is the Norwegian study, all athletes over 18 years of age that were competing in at least one national championship or uh, an Olympic weightlifting event in 2018 and 2019. So this is a 2020 study, but 2018, 2019 data. They had 180 women, 204 men participated. So the prevalence in these young athletes in, for urinary incontinence in women was 50%. So 180 women, 50% of them of these power lifters reported urinary incontinence. 80% of the women reported um, anal incontinence and 23% reported pelvic organ prolapse. And the interesting thing in the men, they found somewhat similar numbers, although the urinary incontinence in men was only about 9.3%, but anal incontinence in men in these power lifters was 61.8%. So in conclusion, the prevalence of pelvic floor dysfunction was high and athletes, by the way, they asked these athletes if they knew how, why they should exercise the pelvic floor muscles and then how they did not necessarily know, but it knows that this is limited knowledge of pelvic floor for muscles. So Dr. Jersley and Natalie, when you think about young people, we always assume people or society assumes that pelvic floor disorders happen in older adults. Mm -hmm. This study with the young power lifters, and it's a niche population, proves otherwise. What's your guys' take on that, on having the message that young people are, are not immune from pelvic floor disorders? Yeah, yeah. I, th I think it's just an important to talk about, about this being potentially everybody's problem. And the and I like how Natalie approaches it. Your, your pelvic floor is like any other area of your body that needs to be strengthened and rehabbed if it's dysfunctional. And so just, you know, making sure everyone knows that these aren't, these aren't just old people problems. And it's not even necessarily that you have to have a problem. Everyone should be aware of their pelvic floor and work to incorporate some form of pelvic floor work and everything that they're doing with physical activity. Right. I think my hesitation when it comes to the studies like that is patients will use pelvic floor disorders as a reason why not to be physically active. Mm. And I have a really hard That's time right. with that uh, yeah. because I, I, I think the opposite. I think they should improve their pelvic floor so that they can be more active and activity will help improve their pelvic floor. So I think it's a, it's, it's a fine line. You know, I have patients all the time who said, oh, I gave up lifting heavy because I have pelvic floor issues. 
And that's where I, I lift heavy all the time. And you have to do it with a well-engaged, strong right. awareness in your pelvic floor. And it, it's not problematic. Right. And I would yeah. agree with that. And, and I think take? those um, in that study, what my, what went to my head with it being more rectal involvement, more rectal uh, prolapse, than, than, than it's than the than. center, you know, it's where they're lifting. It's right. where the center, you know, their center of gravity is most posterior then or backwards when they're lifting. They're not engaging the right muscle. They're right. not engaging their core. They're not engaging the pelvic floor. So those, that, that weight they're lifting is being driven backwards. And that's probably why the posterior part of that pelvic floor is you're seeing more of the loss there, more of the prolapsing. That's where my brain would go. So I agree. You can do whatever you want. If you can do it properly, if right. you can do it correctly, then you can do whatever you want. Oh, wow. This is awesome. Love it. All right, guys, let's get into this frequently asked questions. You're joining here okay. or us here on health 360 with Dr. G sitting down with Dr. Kelly Gershley and Natalie Florio. So I love doing FAQ. So here we go. Uh, Natalie, first one's for you. Do Kegel exercises help with pelvic floor issues? Yes, if they're appropriate. So there are some patients who are not appropriate just to start contracting. And that's where seeing a, a good evaluation with Dr. Dershley or with a physical therapist will tell you, uh, should you be contracting? Are you somebody who sh needs to learn how to relax first um, and then contract? And then once you do, are you breathing right? Breathing is probably the first thing I teach when you're doing a Kegel. So we can, we can get into that too. But are you breathing right? Are you doing the Kegel properly? If you are, absolutely, it's going to help you. All right, here we go. Touch of Jersey. I like this question for you. Uh, here's the next here's the question. How do I know if I need pelvic floor physical therapy? It, if you have a pelvic floor complaint that impacts your ability to do what you want to do is mm -hmm. how I say it. Mm -hmm. All right, I appreciate that one. Here we go. Next one here. I like this one for you, Natalie. How do you strengthen the pelvic floor? So we, I always start out non-weight bearing on the table uh, for a few visits with either manual or um, biofeedback with proper breathing. We're not using other muscles to assist. And then I'm not a therapist that can keep a patient on the table that long. So we, we get it non-weight bearing so they can, you know, if they have a prolapse, they can really see what it feels like without the organs in the way. And we're taking that to standing and we're incorporating it with core and hips, getting into squats and lunges but we started off with really learning how to properly contract. So now we can do it in uh, loading and weight bearing and, and it becomes systemic again. It becomes a full body exercising routine. So. I appreciate you. Here we go. Dr. Jersey. I like this one for you. Skipping around a little bit. Here it is. How does a doctor check for pelvic floor dysfunction? So it starts with the chief complaint and a history. And then I will do a pelvic exam on every patient. So an external genitalia review. Uh, I use a speculum exam. I will split the speculum in two to compartmentalize the areas within the vagina that we look at specifically related to support anteriorly, posteriorly, and then at the apex where the uterus sits. And then I'll do a digital exam to assess for muscle strength, to assess for tension, uterine mobility, I'll look for urethral hypermobility. I'll have a, I do a cough stress test, mm -hmm. have the patient when they're lying for the exam cough to see if they have any leakage of urine. And then as necessary, I'll do a rectal exam. Gotcha. All right. Thank you. Here we go. I like this one. Uh, Nano, this is for you. Should it be standard for a postpartum woman to seek physical pelvic physical therapy, regardless of symptoms? Yes. I have been fighting for this <laughs> when they go to their six week checkup. I have a lot, wanted just to be just a standing order, just come one time. And it's not even about the pelvic floor, pelvic floor, but diastasis recti, which is separation of the core. Cause these new moms want to go and do exercises. And there's certain things they shouldn't be doing if they have that. Um, yeah, just to, just, just to just do one time of exam. If they need therapy, fine. If they don't, you've had a little time to educate them. Um, and they can carry on with what they need to do. But oh, I, for years, I've been trying to get that to go through and it just, I can't get it. I think I, every woman I, should see a pelvic floor physical therapist once just to awesome. learn yes. and get the exercises. The challenge yes. though, and this is, uh, and Natalie can speak to this. How busy are you? Like, we just don't, there, there are not enough people to do what I do. There's not enough therapists yeah. to satisfy the need for all the patients. The hard part is we agree that these are prevalent issues. We need to address care better, but it becomes then a volume issue and we can only yeah. do so much. So we need to spread the word 
work yes. on good home care and then yeah. get the patients that are not seeking care that need care the most. Same. I agree. Yeah. I think our, we have like seven therapists right now between Edward and Elmhurst. That's not a lot for it's not. this huge system. So right. it's, it's yeah. hard to, it's and you're busy, which is great, but yeah. it, you know, there's a lot of issues. Yeah. Well, I appreciate the honesty. I'm just bringing the, bringing it, keeping it real that, that mm -hmm. we need to find ways to expand the pipeline. And so mm -hmm. any uh, young person that's listening to this show right now, um, and, you know, interested yeah. in physical therapy, interested in your gynecology, you know, let's you go. go. Let's go. Yeah. Excellent. Mm -hmm. Here we go. I like this next one here. This is more of a statement. I'm going to have this one for you, Dr. Jershley, and then I have a separate statement for, uh, for Natalie. Here's the statement, Dr. Jershley. Finish the following sentence. The best way to prevent pelvic floor dysfunction from happening is to... <laughs> Um, that is hard. Uh, I think it's twofold. So one, okay. I think is achieve and maintain a healthy body weight. Yeah. I think that's a, a really strong emphasis that we don't make um, thoroughly enough in the discussion of just preventive health care and, and preventive health in general. And um, it, it work properly work your pelvic floor as part of your regular physical activity. All right. I'll, I'll take it. There you go. All right. Nano, this is for easy. You. That <laughs> was a hard one. <laughs> this is for you. And uh, you can piggyback off of what Dr. Jersey said. Ago, but here's a statement. Finish the following sentence. Here we go. Nano, Nano, this is for you. People should start actively protecting their pelvic floor health by. Oh, same thing. I would say exercising, watching your diet. If you have a laborious job where you're going to be lifting stuff, you're somebody who really should be um, focusing on getting that pelvic, men and women getting that pelvic floor strengthened. Um, yeah, I would say mm -hmm. diet, exercise. I, I agree with Dr. Dursley. And then I, and then I can even go on to patients who've had, um, who wear back braces or um, who've had surgeries and are wearing braces. Now the diaphragm is not moving right. So if you're somebody who has to wear a brace because you work at Amazon lifting, which I've seen, I've had a patient like that. She didn't realize that back brace was, mm -hmm. you know, not allowing her to breathe properly. Mm -hmm. So now we're causing more pressure. So I, I think early on, early on, we all need to just start doing exercise, strengthening education. We all need to get educated early on about this stuff. I, I appreciate it. Here we go. This is the next one. I'm going to give this one to me. I'm skipping around a little bit, but I like this one. This is for Dr. G and I'm, this one for the fellas. So here's the, here's the myth. Here's the uh, FAQ. Can a weak pelvic floor cause erectile dysfunction? And I'll say this fellas. Yes. And here's my words, the bubble cavernosis muscle. So it's a muscle that's in the pelvic floor. That muscle normally compresses the deep, the deep dorsal vein of the penis to prevent the outflow of blood from an enlarged penis. So if there is weakness in the pelvic floor and thus weakness in this bubble cavernosis muscle, the outflow of blood may not be prevented as well, thus leading to erectile dysfunction. There you go, fellas. I gave you one. There we go. All right. That's it here. Uh, Natalie, I like this one for you. Here's a question. Um, are pelvic floor disorders a normal part of aging? We might've dispelled that one already. Yes and no. You know, there's some different studies out there. Yes, uh, hormones change, our ligaments change, elasticity mm -hmm. changes. But there was a study in like 2007 of, um, I'm blanking out on the guy's name, where their study showed it was more disease-related issues versus age-related issues with some of the reasons why. But yes, I, I mean, I think Dr. Dershley, you would agree, right? Uh, yeah, I, it's kind of like spinal stenosis in the spine. Are we going to get some arthritis? Yes. What do we do about it? How do we prevent it? What do we do if mm. we get it? I, I kind of treat it the same way. So yeah, but I think it's your take, your take on that. So, I mean, this is just me. Part, yeah. I hate the word normal, Yeah. right? So yeah. it's part of aging. Yes. Yeah. Is it normal? Dysfunction is never normal. Is it pathologic? Maybe not. I, yeah. I'd say it all the time to patients. You can have pelvic floor dysfunction that doesn't impact your life. It then it doesn't have to be a big deal. So if it doesn't bother you, it doesn't bother me. That's what I tell them. Gosh. If it doesn't impact your ability to be active, then we can just keep an eye on it and, and follow it. Everything changes with age. And I think one of the reasons I was so interested in having just this conversation with you all is because we don't talk about these things well. And, and it starts with your, I mean, it, start, it starts earlier, but even with pregnancy and delivery, your body changes. That's good and bad. It doesn't have to be 
um, terrible for the future. It doesn't have to, you know, it doesn't, it's not a death sentence. You just have to learn to manage what comes up. And so with aging, things change too. Mm -hmm. Skin changes, vagina changes, hormones change, bowel changes, all those things can impact pelvic floor function. And so just understanding it and knowing when you need to get further help is important. All right. I love it. Here we go. This one's for you, Dr. Dershowitz. We'll do a couple more of these FAQs. I like this one. Um, can, can radiographic imaging, including MRI, ultrasound, CT scans, help detect pelvic floor dif- dysfunction? Yeah, it's interesting. I, don't, I mean, so I might be nitpicky here, but okay. help detect. I mean, they certainly can identify it. Absolutely. We see it all the time on imaging. Um, I like to say affectionately, I treat patients, not pictures. And so If a patient has a radiographic uh, demonstration of a rectocele, but they don't have any rectocele complaints and it's not significant in their life, then I don't know that it matters much. Sometimes you can use additional imaging to give you more information, especially MRI with certain soft tissue things, if you're going to work toward more thorough management or evaluation. Um, So yes, you can identify it radiographically. You know you do not require MRI to diagnose it exclusively. All right, love it. Here we go. Natalie, I like this one for you. Here we go. I like this question. Um, uh, Let's do this one. I like this one here. What are reverse Kegels? Reverse Kegels are uh, when you have that increased tone. So you have tight muscle. You're kind of teaching somebody how to um, bulge down or um, like if you're making a bowel movement, you're kind of pushing out. I can't say I teach those a lot though. Mm-hmm. I find other ways to try to decrease that tone. Um, mm-hmm. I use it to show them how they can relax the floor by pushing down, bearing down, I guess is a better word I'm trying to say. Um, but it's just to try to relax that pelvic floor that's a little tight. But I, I don't know, I always, and it might just be personally, I find other ways to help decrease that tone versus teaching how to bear down um, because I feel like then you can make other issues if you're doing yeah. too much of that. So, right. but that's what it is. Yeah. Dr. George Lee, here's the last FAQ that we'll get into some misrespects, but I like this one. Here it is. Uh, people may ask you this question quite a bit, but here's a common question that's asked. Um, <laughs> does caffeine affect the pelvic floor? Yes. Caffeine can impact both bladder and bowel function, which can impact your pelvic floor. So caffeine plays a role for sure. Yeah. All right, got it. So let's do a section here. Thank you, Dr. Gersley and Natalie for that awesome stuff on FAQs. Uh, section that we do each week on Health 360 with Dr. Dr. G each episode, I should say. Um, if I was doing it each week, I'd be, I'd have this as a full-time gig and I wouldn't be able to see patients, but no, we always appreciate it. I always appreciate bringing you guys, this, listeners out there, information as much as possible. But here it is, Miss versus facts. I asked, uh, so I'll say a statement and we're setting the record straight. And so I'll say the statement and then we'll get through as many of these as we can. Dr. Jersley and Natalie will say myth or fact, they'll say why, but we want to make sure that the record is straight and make sure that you have the right information out there. So here it is, Dr. Jersley, here's the first statement, myth or fact, please explain. Only women have pelvic floors. Myth. Please explain. But you just explained to us. <laughs> I know. Very much. I know. Has erectile dysfunction. Well, yeah. yeah, I know. It's true. Uh, yeah. And I would say I probably throw, throw, throw a shout out there. I don't know if I call it a shout out, but but men uh, uh, certainly uh, a common center that we'll see uh, post uh, radical prostatectomy, and they will have pelvic dysfunction. A lot of symptoms with that diet, with that surgical procedure. So, uh, but throw it out there, men. We're not forgetting about you. Again, men have pelvic floor dysfunction right. as well too. All right, Natalie. Here's a statement. Yeah. Myth or fact? Please explain. Um, I like this one. It's not possible. Here we go. Speaking of men, here we go, Ben. I'm showing it to you. Uh, it's not possible for men to exercise their pelvic floor as women do. False. They absolutely can. We have two therapists actually that two or three that actually treat men. Um, men have the pelvic floor, same as the women. Uh, it just, uh, you know, one part grew into another part for a male that grew in for, you know, that they're for a woman, but, um, the, the bottom line is we all have a pelvic floor. So absolutely. If I do get a back, pain or a, um, a post-op patient who's a male. And I ask them about their bowel and bladder now, instead of just brushing over it, if they say, well, I've had incontinence way before the surgery, we take care of it. We can do an external, um, assessment, but they can be taught the same contraction, the same strengthening mm-hmm. as a woman. So yeah, it, that's yeah. No, they Set do. the record straight. All yeah. right. Uh, Dr. Jersey, I like this quite like this statement with the fact, please explain my pelvic floor is ruined from having kids. There's no point. False. 
<laughs> your, your pelvic floor isn't ruined. It's never ruined. There are ways to address all of the complaints. There we go. Just being honest. Here we go. I love it. We've been saying this the, this entire time. Here we go. Uh, Dr. Jersey, I'm coming back at you. Here we go. Uh, Kegels are always a cure for pelvic floor problems. No, I think that's, <laughs> I think that, I mean, I, yeah. we've said that a lot here. Yeah. Uh, Kegels, is, especially improperly done Kegels can do more harm than good. And like Natalie was indicating, when you have um, increased tone or tension, Kegels are the wrong way to address the problem. And sometimes we've seen patients who come and see me and say, well, I've done thousands of Kegels yeah, yeah. And, and now the tension that they've developed from too many Kegels is part of the problem. Well, there you go. That's right. true. All right. I appreciate it. Uh, Natalie, I like this one. Here it is. With the fact, please explain. We'll do a couple more of these. I've only had cesarean sections, so I don't need to worry Not about true. my pelvic floor. False. That's totally false. Uh, I get a lot please of women who never had kids and they have pelvic floor dysfunction, right? Mm -hmm. So there's many reasons. It's not just about uh, childbirth or just because there was no tearing or trauma to the vaginal area doesn't mean that there was still extra weight. Um, but again, you can be a woman who never even had a cesarean, never even had children and you can still have a pelvic floor issue. So that's a huge false. All right, I'm going to come back to you here with scissors. We'll do two more. Uh, now, this one's for you, and I'll get the last one for Dr. Chersley. Here's a statement. Myth effect, please explain. I've tried pelvic floor exercises, and they don't do anything. Myth effect, please explain. Is it me or Dr. Yeah, Chersley? That's, that's you. Oh, me. Oh, yeah, there, there you go. Oh, that's, um, that means that you're not doing them properly, <laughs> or, or there's something else going on. Because, again, it's not a cure all. Like we've talked about before, it's not just a Kegel that's going to change everything. You can't lay or just do Kegels. And that's the only exercise you do and expect to get better. There's other puzzle pieces to this. So either you're not doing it properly. You haven't been trained properly. You shouldn't be doing them if you haven't had a correct exam, or you are not adding in the right layers of strengthening. So you're not going to achieve what you're looking for. I so, appreciate you. Okay, sorry. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, Dr. Jersley, here's the last one. Through fact, please explain. Here it is. All pelvic health problems are related to weakness in the pelvic floor. Myth. Please Not explain. true. Sometimes it's too much tension. Yeah. Absolutely. Wonderful. Yeah. Well, there you have it, everybody. Miss versus fact, you know, just trying to set the record straight uh, for you to be empowered in your health decision making. And again, of course, if there's any questions, of course, reach out to your healthcare provider. You know, nothing's off topic, as we mentioned in the beginning of this episode. So there we go. So we have about five minutes left. We're just time has flown by. We've been having a lot of fun here, but really trying to break down the importance of not being uh, afraid to speak up. Uh, if you have a health problem, we want to hear. It's the only way that we can help. Uh, you know, and we want to make sure that you feel comfortable. And again, you will not be judged. And we'll do it in a way that just makes sure that you have all the resources for long lasting success. So in the beginning, we call it the chief complaint. In the end, we call it the assessment and plan. And of course, that's when we give somebody a diagnosis. We give them a treatment plan. And of course, we schedule a follow-up. So I'll start with you, Natalie. Give us a few take-home points today for people that have been listening to the show. You know, what's important for them to take away for far, uh, as far as pelvic health and the importance of their pelvic health? So I think for me, my passion comes through with um, patients understanding this past um, hour or so that it's not just about the pelvic floor. If you had neck pain or back pain, you'd go to the doctor. And I know it can be embarrassing, but go get it checked out if you're having symptoms. Um, my second take home would be um, that we have become a society with really cute commercials for poise pads and these cute discreet underwear with cute spokes models. Nobody should be leaking. Um, you know, it, it, go get it checked out. Like it's, it's if you haven't gotten it checked out um, and you haven't seen somebody it's become like a norm that we just go and buy these pads with incontinence. And again, that lets you know how prevalent it is, yeah. but there's something that could be done with it. And I think the, my strongest passion comes for it's my kids always saying, Oh mom, YOLO, you only live once. If you are not leaving your house because you are afraid to leak, whether it be urine or feces, or you're not leaving your house because you have overactive bladder and you need to know where a bathroom is every five minutes you need to go get something um, addressed. You need to get it looked at because you only live once and you shouldn't let that stop you from living your life and doing what you want to do. So that's where I'm really passionate when I hear that in the 
in my clinic. So. Well, thank you, Natalie. And I appreciate all your contributions uh, to this episode and just your passion, what you do. And of course, you know, certainly taking care of so many amazing patients of mine. Thank you very much. Okay. So uh, Dr. Gershley, give us a few take-home points from your perspective. You know, what should people be taking away? They've listened to this, they've listened to this podcast. They're, they've been taking notes. They, they hopefully, um, you, know, ha- you know, may have more questions, but, but what should people take away about the importance of pelvic floor health? So I think the, the most in common, the, the most important is to talk about how common it is. So we've, we've all talked about this. It, there are lots of pelvic floor complaints. Women and men can have these issues. And it's something that if it impacts your ability to do what you want to do every day should be brought up because there are a lot of ways to manage. There are conservative to aggressive, you know, I'll, I'll, I'll see patients who don't want surgery, which is great because there's lots of other options. I have patients who don't want PT. There's other options. There's, there's a whole a variety of ways we can manage symptoms. I think it's important to stay active. I'm convinced activity is the key to longevity. I think one of my passions is working to improve um, overall wellness as a marker for general health. So just yes. encouraging patients to be active. And if your activity is limited because of these bulge or leakage issues, there are certainly ways to address it. Um, I think it's important to, to talk about bowel health and how bowels should be moving every day. And if they're not, it's gonna potentially impact other areas. Um, and I think, you know, totally echo- echoing on what Natalie says, um, I tell patients all the time, life is short, you gotta live it. You have to, yes. to be active and, and um, make the most of every day. Wonderful. I appreciate you as well too, Dr. Churchill, you know, contributing some amazing content and also really being there for my patients when, when uh, it's like, it's like, it's like, I had no problem. Like, I love it when I could like, I could call you up or text right. you like, oh my gosh, doc, I've got somebody who's really struggling. Can you, can you help me out? And you always do. And same with you, Natalie. I mean, you both have been there for me so many times and I appreciate you both. Before we get to my final thoughts, let me do a section here on Health 360 with Dr. G that we do call listener healthy oh yeah content. So here's a quote from loyal listener KS. Here it is. Got it in today. Got out with the with the cross country kids. Instantly thought of you, Dr. G. Oh, that was so nice. So thank you, KS. And I know who KS is and KS is an amazing loyal listener. So thank you, KS. And again, for you out there, I genuinely enjoy hearing about your success stories. And again, always reach out to me. And again, you never know if your story maybe a catalyst for someone else needs to hear it. So my final thoughts are this. Many people don't feel comfortable talking about personal topics like pelvic floor disorders and symptoms such as incontinence, but these are actually very common medical problems that can be treated successfully. Mm -hmm. Millions of people have the same issues, but many don't seek treatment and thus compromise their quality of life. If you have a public health issue, don't hesitate to learn more about your treatment options. If your doctor doesn't treat these issues regularly, then seek out an expert. You are not alone, and there are people out there to help you along the way. So I want to thank my guests today, Dr. Kelly Gershley and Natalie Foley. Let me read the credentials again. Dr. Kelly Gershley, board-certified urogynecologist with Illinois uh, Urogynecology LTD, of course, medical director of the Women's Center for Public Health at Edward Hospital, and of course, Natalie Florio, amazing physical therapist, Edward Elmer's Health. Thank you both for coming on the show. Thank I you. Appreciate you. It was fun. So, oh, it was fun. All right, we'll do it again next time. I can't wait to connect with you both soon. Hey, everybody. You've been listening to and watching Health 360 with Dr. G, a healthy driven podcast. This episode is written by Mark D. Gomez, MD, and Tiffany E.R. Gomez. Producers are Tiffany E.R. Gomez and Sarah Zwack. Audio and video production specialist is Mike Paskey, copyright 2022. Edward Elmer's Health, all rights reserved. For more awesome health information, visit me at health360podcast.com and follow me across all social media at health360 WDG. This is Dr. G signing off. And until next time, peace out. Mm -hmm.